vital meeting. We have been trying to persuade them for some days now that it's safe, but they have yet to believe us, although it would appear that it's starting to come out of the mountains now. The first ones to leave the mountains were those who had no choice. The sick, mostly the very young, as well as many pregnant women. To stay could have meant death. For the most urgent cases, helicopters were needed. It was the first task for 846 Squadron from RNES Yeobleton. Within hours of arriving, their seeking helicopters were airborne again, this time on their way to Sinat camp, inaccessible by road. On the ground, Marines from 4-5 Commando were already helping the refugees to pack their belongings. Another unfamiliar role for them. Hands more used to gripping guns, cradling and protecting babies instead. Helping the elderly who struggled through the difficult terrain to get to the helicopters. Even though the crews had just come back from the Gulf War, the sights that greeted them were still shocking. There's a real eye opener. Um, nothing you see on TV, actually, uh, on the news, prepares you for doing it for real. And uh, it was almost a sense of unreality of being there and, and being surrounded by it. What was news yesterday, you were amongst today. Uh, quite extraordinary. Distressing at all? Um, yes, especially the children. One of our last lifts was mainly children. And uh, you just feel so desperately sorry for them. Seekings normally carry 16 troops but the crews crammed as many people on board as possible. With the urgency of the task, the rule book went out the window. We stopped counting after a while. Uh, we assumed that they were not as well fed as we were, so they weren't as heavy as we were. We just uh, put as many in as we could, but the aircraft was still capable of flying with. Um, I think in all, the two aircraft lifted about 200 off the mountains. <laughs> <laughs> As the word spread that it was safe to come down, the trickle of refugees willing to return to Iraq became a steady flow. The Commando Logistics Regiment from Plymouth laid on transport to bring hundreds of Kurds down from one of the more accessible camps. They were going back to Zaku, the first town to be freed from Iraqi control. For many of the refugees, it was the first sight of their homeland for up to five months, and more and more appeared to want to return. Yesterday they were a little bit dubious about, about coming down, and we really had to coax them into coming down. But uh, this morning, uh, we had, had to be very careful that they weren't overloading the vehicles. They were trying to stow away all over the place. But um, yes, they're, they're very pleased to be going home at long last. But most of the refugees weren't going straight home. First stop was the newly built relief camp near Zaku. After the conditions they'd been living in, the camp was a welcome sight. Some were just passing through, recuperating briefly before going on to their nearby homes. But others would have to stay because their houses had been destroyed by the Iraqis. Many were waiting for the Allies to clear the Iraqi army out of their towns and guaranteed security before moving on. How long will you stay here then? That depends on solution, um, uh, I mean political solution, after we get something guaranteed, making sure that we got our autonomy, we will be back to our cities, maybe one month or two months. The camp was full and expanding all the time. As fast as tents were put up, refugees were moving in. They were guaranteed food, water and good sanitation, as well as security. And there were also medical checks for every new arrival. How old did you say it was? 14 months. 14 months. But some, particularly the children, were too ill to stay. This baby had suffered from diarrhoea for a month. The, the baby's dehydrated and you can see the way the skin stays up. This is, the poor baby's ha had uh, chest infection and gastroenteritis at just four months. To save its life, the baby would have to go to the nearby hospital, which had slightly better facilities. There, nurses and medical staff from the Marines were part of the international teams. The baby took us out. 
Oh, you're seeing her in the mouth. Is she okay? This girl was four years old. The state of the babies shocked the medics from Plymouth. It's very upsetting at first, yeah. Yesterday I saw them for my first time. And yeah, it's very, very upsetting. There's some twins next door. One is only two pounds in weight. And it's just like a skeleton. It's just lifeless. They're floppy. They've got huge tummies. They're so helpless. And then you see all the families are so appreciative and they're smiling. All the, the other children are so happy. And the women are lovely as well. It is rewarding work. It wasn't just the babies that needed care. The camps had taken their toll on all age groups. This man's family had been told he had TB. You know, we just told him today that you know, he's, going, he's going to die and you know, trying to get those people to accept it as much as possible, but he's, like, there's no use even doing skin care on him. Like he's, he's too far gone. He's living carcass. And hundreds more people were still dying in the mountains. They were unable or unwilling to leave. The situation was worst at Kukurja, the largest and most remote refugee camp. The sheer size was astounding. 130,000 people stretching down the valley for two and a half miles. And up to 50 were dying each day in the dreadful conditions. The conditions are, are miserable up in there. It's uh, like walking into a refuse pit. There is a danger of a cholera epidemic at this time. We've had a couple of uh, unconfirmed cases. We've got some people in quarantine areas, uh, in a quarantine area. We're, we're right now constructing a quarantine area up there uh, with the uh, Doctors Without Borders group. And uh, we're just going to be prepared for the worst as it stands right now. Speak English. We need stones, heavy Helping the Kurds to help themselves were Marines from 40 Commando, working with American special forces who'd taken control of the camp. A hospital tent was erected 7,500 feet up the mountain. It meant the sick wouldn't have to struggle for hours up and down for help or simply die at the top. He's got pneumonia and he's dehydrated. So we gave him some fluids and some antibiotics and now he's talking to us. The medics had arrived just in time. The boy's case was so urgent he had to be treated in the open before the hospital was completed. Food was no longer the greatest problem. Tons of supplies were arriving daily. Army rations had relieved the immediate famine and basic provisions were getting through, enabling the refugees to cook for themselves. But with so many people living on top of each other without proper sanitation, disease was the biggest fear. Diarrhea was rife and with the arrival of warmer weather, the danger of other epidemics increased all the time. And the change in the weather towards the scorching heat of summer would bring more than just whirlwinds. There was another, more pressing reason for the Kurds to go down. Obviously you've got to go off this mountain soon because the water's running out, isn't it? The, you know the snow up there on the, the mountains? There? Yeah, yeah the that'll go soon and your water will dry out. Uh, what I see. Water? Water? Yeah. Yes, yes. That, that'll go soon. Yes. Yeah. So you're going to have to go off the mountain soon, yes? Yes. yes. Yeah. But the Kurds have a saying, that the mountains are their only friends, and the Marines had seen for themselves why they were so reluctant to leave. The Iraqis have really you know, ruined everything. All the towns on the side of the road have been sort of just raised to the ground. They've just been demolished, not blown or anything. They've just sort of been bulldozed. So uh, they've not really got much of a home to go back to a lot of them. I have my house yeah. in Bamani. Yeah. Is there. But now they crash. No house. I have no house. It's the whole, whole town like that. Yeah. They uh, yeah. buy TNT. Buy TNT. The Marines in the camps were not facing guns and twitchy Iraqi soldiers, but they were on the emotional front line. Oh. I go by helicopter. You don't want to go to Shandalay. It's a bad camp. 
I told you. What? They were constantly called on for reassurance and bombarded with questions they couldn't answer. What about future? We don't know. Some people from Kirkuk. How about them? Okay, you know, I'm, I am a soldier. I'm not a politician. I can only tell you what I know. I understand what you're saying. You want, you want to have a normal life. That's what I mean. You want to have a normal, civilized life, like everybody else. We can't believe Saddam's prom promise. Yeah. Only. I know. He's, Saddam has made many promises, but he never will keep them. Yeah. And that conviction haunted many Kurds, although negotiations with the Iraqi government for autonomy seemed to be making progress, there was deep resistance among the refugees to going home. I want to live in, in, in any country. Some people. Some people... Except Iraq. Except Iraq. We want to live. I want to live. Because we know uh, what happens if there is no uh, protect, protection. Is if, if you, 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 you haven't pro protect, no, nobody protection us, we know what they do with us. Still so fearful about the future, it wasn't surprising that some of the refugees wanted to cling on to the men who'd given them the safety and compassion they hadn't experienced for years. They were afraid about what would happen when the Marines had to leave. We don't want them to leave us here. We don't want, because we will... I think we will die here, for sure. We want to go with the Marines, or with the British Army. When they go, we want to go. But senior officers said the bonds that developed between the Marines and the Kurds must not become too strong. A lot of the men are, are identifying quite understandably with their cause. What we must avoid, and what I have been at pains to point out to my people we must avoid, is becoming uh, indispensable to the Kurds. And so we must go out of our way to help them to help themselves rather than to spoon feed them and to do it for them. I certainly don't intend to take up permanent residence in North Iraq with my brigade. Uh, and as I've explained, we're here to, to create a safe haven and it will be for others to judge when, when the haven is large enough and safe enough, uh, the Kurds and others. And when we've done that, we will retire gracefully. But the British forces are still there and will not leave northern Iraq until the Allies find a way to make sure Saddam Hussein can no longer persecute the Kurds. That could mean basing a rapid reaction force in southern Turkey, poised to go into Iraq in event of trouble. In the meantime, the Marines have continued to help the Kurds, a task that's taken its toll on even the strongest soldier. There's a new expression which I'd never heard before, uh, but I hear quite a lot since I've been here, called uh, compassion fatigue. And I've seen people suffering from it, uh, who've been right up in some of the worst of the uh, settlements where these Kurdish people are, where conditions are dreadful. And I think there's a quality in Marines which is not generally appreciated, and that is compassion. And I'm sure you've seen it, as I have, uh, that is very much in evidence. Thank you.